Okay, if you could turn in our Bibles please to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're looking at verses 13 to 16. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. It's going to be a short devotion tonight. Uh, we're looking at the theme, liberty and love. Liberty and love. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 13 to 16. Just plonk your eyes in the word of God and follow down with me. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion unto the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not, see those words, ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Father, we just pray that tonight you will uh, we'll just seek thy understanding, Lord, in these few words and help us, Lord, to uh, apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The call to liberty. We see this in verse 13. The call to liberty. Where it says, For brethren, ye have been called to liberty. If you see parts A and C on this, uh, in that verse, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. It is a calling. Once we're saved, we have been called unto liberty. Isaiah 61.1 says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So we see here that even the Lord Jesus read these words, these very words about himself uh, while he was in the temple. And they knew it, he was talking about himself. And I think there was a stunned silence because they knew he was talking about himself in the temple. But he has called us so we are not bound anymore. He's called us unto liberty. To proclaim liberty in Isaiah 61.1 to the captives. So the lost today... Indeed, the lost world has been held captive from liberty and in bondage. We see the words, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. See, Christ, through his precious blood that he shed on Calvary, has opened the doors to the prison that most people are bound in. Most people are bound in. And he's called us to proclaim liberty. He proclaimed liberty to us. So you see, brethren, we have been called unto liberty the call of liberty John chapter 8 verses 34 to 36 has these words to say Jesus answered them verily verily I say unto you whoso committeth sin is the servant of sin this is John 8 34 to 36 and the servant abideth not in the house forever but the son abideth ever if the son therefore shall make you free you shall be free indeed. Once again, sin holds us in bondage. We are in prison, as it were, as the book of Isaiah states. But if the Son, Jesus Christ, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Indeed, you shall be free. And this is our call unto liberty. Romans chapter 6 verse 18, if you'd like to turn there. Romans chapter 6 verse 18. The word of God says, being then made free from sin. You see that? Being made free from sin. Ye become the servants of righteousness. You see, there's been a change of allegiance here. Where once we serve Satan and the devil in this world, and indeed ourselves... Now we're serving righteousness. We're serving Christ who is our righteousness. For all our righteousness, brethren, are filthy rags. But we rely on his righteousness. This is what gets us into heaven. 
This is what saves our mortal soul, his righteousness. Nothing that we've done or can do except to accept his free gift. Accept his free gift. Being then made free from sin, that we're no more in bondage, we're no more held captive. As the book of Isaiah says in chapter 61 and verse 1. And this is what Christ indeed had been sent for, to set us free and to heal the brokenhearted, as it says back there in Isaiah. He has sent me, this is God the Father, has sent Christ to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Many people today are held captive and slaves to sin. And indeed, that is their God. Once again, if you just look at Galatians, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. Galatians 5, 1. <clears throat> it says here, Stand fast, therefore, in the what? In the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. These words can't be any more plainer. Christ makes us free. And if, he's tr and if you've trusted in him, you have been made free from the law of sin and death. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What Paul was getting into the Galatians, because they had a real issue there with Judaism, and they were going back into ceremonial law. Indeed, ceremonial salvation. We see that today when people think, well, baptism in the water saves us now. Well, no, it doesn't. It's accepting Jesus Christ as your saviour. That's what gets you over the line. Water baptism is just a symbol of the monument of the resurrection that now we have when we pass from this earth. But stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Obviously, they had a problem. They were not standing fast. The Galatians were not standing fast. Because I believe here somewhere, and I forget which verse it is, but it says, Who hath bewitched you, O Galatians? They were being bewitched. Are being seduced by deceiving men and trying to tell them, oh yes, faith plus works. That does not work because it makes void what Christ has done on the cross. It makes it void. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So the, here we see that the Galatians were, were going back into this ceremonialism. The law. You've got to keep the law to be saved. No, no, no. You need to trust in Christ and have faith in the righteousness of Christ. So two questions tonight, uh, just on what we've read there. There were several points tonight, but who or what is the source of our liberty? Who or what is the source of our liberty? Source of our liberty. It's Jesus Christ. He is the source of our liberty. He is. And from what are we liberated from? Sin, that's it. The world, self. We are liberated from self. We're liberated from sin and all the wicked devices that Satan can throw at us. We've been liberated from that. So why should we entangle ourselves again in the affairs of this world with whatever may please us? It could be just covetousness. It could be anything. We don't need to entangle ourselves once again in the world. Point two, the use of liberty. Let's look at verse 13 of chapter 5. Verse 13 again. The parts D and E of chapter of uh, verse 13. It says here, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Okay, so you're at liberty now. But don't use that for an occasion to the flesh, to please the flesh. But by love serve one another. So this is the use of liberty that we'll look at now. Don't use it for an occasion to the flesh because you are liberated now and you are living forever in eternity. But by love, serve one another. This is what liberty is. We're supposed to be serving one another. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 9. If you could just keep your bookmark in that uh, Galatians chapter 5. But 1 Corinthians, this was just before Galatians, uh, chapter 8, verse 9. The word of God says... But take heed, in other words, look out, but take heed 
lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours, this liberty now, this freedom you now have in Christ, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Because we may be able to do certain things now, but for the weak person, you know, that could be a stumbling block. You know, like Romans 14 says, you know, not to some people can eat um, meat that have been sacrificed to idols and others couldn't. So for the sake for those of us who can eat meat that have been sacrificed to idols, knowing that an idol is nothing, but yet someone who is weak in the faith, if we eat that meat in front of them, it would bring offence to them. So we've got to look after those who are weaker in the faith. So even though we're at liberty, we mustn't let our liberty Cause others to sin. 1 Peter 2.16 says also this, and now we're talking of the use of liberty. 1 Peter 2.16. It says these words, As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, be as the servants of God. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. So we mustn't use it in the worldly sense, our liberty. We mustn't let it hide certain sins in our lives as free and not using it for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fill, fill sorry, the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2 Now we're getting somewhere with the use of liberty. Galatians 6.2 Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfil the law of Christ. See, this is what our liberty brings us to. Helping others, edifying others, exhorting others, helping others by bearing one another's burdens. This is what our liberty should be, we should be doing with our liberty that we have. Bearing one another's burdens, no matter what that may be. And then we fulfil the law of Christ. And we'll see shortly what this law is. Romans 15, 1 to 2. Romans 15, 1 to 2. I'll just give you a few seconds to turn up there, but Romans 15, 1 to 2. It says these words. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And what? Not to please ourselves. So sometimes the liberty that we have in Christ, we can tend to please ourselves. And we're not looking out for the infirmities of our weaker brothers or sisters. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please what his neighbour for his good to edification. So our use of liberty now is that we're doing good works because of the liberty now we have. We are free from sin and the good works we do we're allowed to do because we're doing it on the behalf of Christ, on his behalf. So the use of liberty, just a question. What is meant by the fleshly use of liberty? Pleasing ourselves. That's what it is. We're using our liberty uh, to please the flesh. We're only pleasing ourselves. We're just pleasing self. We're doing what we want to do. You know, it could be just something as simple as not going to church on a Sunday because I want to go do something else. You see, we're pleasing ourselves. But the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 25, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And if you've got a newly born Christian, so to speak, coming into the flock, and they see that you're habitually taking days off to please yourself on a certain Sunday, they'll say, oh, maybe I can do that. But the Lord says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's just one example. I'm sure you can think of a lot more. But that's what it is. We're pleasing ourselves. And we should be edifying others, showing them the way. Those that are weak, this is what you do. You read the word of God. You might decide, well, I haven't got time to read the Word of God this week and we just give it a flick and put it down. Um, but 
really, we're, it's, it's a stumbling block to those that are weak. Because the Bible says walk in the flesh. We've got to show them to walk in the flesh. We're not at liberty just to please ourselves. We know we won't lose our salvation for it, but that's using it as a cloak of maliciousness in that sense. In that sense. So what is meant by the fleshly use of liberty? Pleasing yourselves. Self. And that's what we've got to be on the watch out for. And another question. What is the intended use of liberty? Infirmities. To please your neighbour and to edify. That's the intended use of liberty. And it says here, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, because we are weak in the flesh. Okay? But by love serve one another. We are serving others, our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as those that need to come to Christ. As well as those that need to come to Christ. And we must be gentle as we bring them to Christ. Point three, the law of liberty in verse 14 of chapter 5 in Galatians. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love, that's the one word, um, thy neighbour as thyself. So it's Galatians 5, 14. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Not just your saved neighbour, your unsaved neighbour. Just stay there because I'll just um, read a couple of extra verses just to, to, to bring this point out. James 2, 8 says, If ye fulfil the royal law according to the scripture... Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, ye do well. This is the royal law, which this verse 14 is talking about. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. This is the royal law. The royal law. Matthew, once again, you don't have to turn there, Matthew 22, 39 to 40. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Just two commandments. This is what the Old Testament hangs on. Love thy neighbour as thyself. Now this is written and said of the word of God. That's what it's talking about. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And this is the royal law. We see a lot of people today, they, as you'll see in a second, they bite and devour another one, one another in churches. What, what happened to the royal law? Is it just thrown out the window, trampled underfoot? What have we been set free from? Sin. And absolutely sin. And set liberty unto Christ. Because it's his righteousness that gets us over the line in, those, in, that, in that sense. Don't have to turn there, but Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath what? Fulfilled the law. Fulfilled the law. Verse 14, just look at that again. For all the law, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love is that word. And we are to love. Romans 13, 10. Love worketh no will to his neighbour. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, no arguing, hating, vaunting oneself, and life's all about me. But what do we see in this world today? Everything's about me. Well, I need this, I need that, especially in marriage. You've got the husband going one way, saying, I need, deserve to be happy. You've got the wife going another way, I deserve to be happy. And there's the children in the middle and they're very unhappy. I want to be happy. I deserve it. Oh, so do I. The children are in the middle, falling into the pit of drug addiction and whatever else will come their way because of a broken family. That's what happens. We're not loving our neighbour. Your neighbour could be your wife or your husband. Well, it is. We are to love one another and fulfil the royal law. Two questions on this one. Why does the Bible use the term the royal law? Because God is king. 
He's king. That's why, and he's the king of his kingdom. That's why the, it's the royal law. And he has commanded it. What does love mean in the context of these scriptures? Answer to this, doing right with others. It's the word joy, like we saw a couple of weeks ago. Jesus, others, yourself. And that's the way it should go. That freedom that you live in is the way it should go. And that will not only bring joy to others, but joy to ourself, knowing that we've fulfilled the royal law. Point four, the abuse of liberty. Let's see verse 15 of uh, Galatians 5. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So there, this is church strife happening here with the Galatians. They're fighting, they're scrapping, probably over the flowers that someone put in that morning. <laughs> well, it's true, I've seen fights over that in churches. Um, all sorts of crazy things. But that's what happens. That's what happens when we don't fulfil the royal law. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. They must have been having a good stink going on in this church. All these churches in Galatia. They must have really been fighting. And all because of a bad doctrine coming in. Faith plus works. And it was wrecking them. It was wrecking them. They were fulfilling the flesh. They weren't caring for one another. Which is what we've got to do. And that'll wreck any church. Once we start putting self above others. It's got to be the other way around. You know, the, um, uh, the fruits of the Spirit. Think of the fruits of the Spirit. They're the first fruits we should be looking at. In our own lives. In our own lives. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. And indeed, there have been times when people do consume others. Marriages get destroyed, friendships get wrecked, you know, church attendance goes down, and they're being consumed. And Satan's having a field day. But we're being consumed. No need to turn there, but James 4, verses 1 to 3 says these, these words. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and, look at this, desire to have and cannot attain. Cannot attain, but ye desire it. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not. Because he asks amiss, that you may what? Consume it upon your lusts. That's what happens. This is the abuse of liberty. Now we're saved now, but we're still living in the world. We're still living a carnal life. And we're abusing this use of liberty because we are saved and going to hell. But we're abusing it. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, For ye are yet carnal. Carnal is a weak Christian, someone who hasn't grown, but someone who is living in the world and for the world. They've been saved, but they've just been fed milk over the years. Or don't bother with getting into the meat of the word, and they're carnal. For ye are yet carnal, for as there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men, the men of the world? Yes, we can be. Galatians 5.26 let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. This is what was happening to the churches in Galatia, envying one another. It sounds like they were trying to, to make that hierarchical system that we see today in so many churches. You know, Christ, we're all on the level playing field. It's Christ who is up there and who we serve. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Because it is vain. If we're glorying in self, Jesus Christ said himself when I return, no flesh will glory at my appearing. None. No one. None of us will not glory at his appearing. James 3, 14 to 16. No need to turn there, but the word of God says this. But if ye have bitter envying, and strife in your hearts. The, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. If you have it in your hearts, 
glory not. But I think some of us have been in churches where people got glory by having envying and etc. in our hearts and strife and bitter envying. Envying, sorry. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, so it's not from God. Where's it from? But is earthly, sensual, devilish. Not demonish, devilish. The word demon is not in our King James Bibles. It's devils or spirits, evil spirits, unclean spirits, but never a demon. That's, an, that's a, a manifestation of man's imagination because they draw demons with genitals, etc. Well, when the devils were kicked or the wicked angels were kicked out of heaven, they didn't have, they weren't breathing. They didn't breathe. There's no baby angels in heaven. It's a figment of man's imagination. A demon. That's what we've drawn up. So I'm trying to wean myself off that word. Verse 16 of James, it says here, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Everyone's confused. Well, shouldn't Christians behave like this and that and everything else? But they're fighting and scrapping, they're divided, they're, they're not agreeing on things and they're not trusting in the word. That's what's happening. And it'll wreck a church. We are not at liberty to wreck churches. I think at the uh, judgment seat of Christ, there'll be a lot of bitter tears over that one. A lot of bitter tears from people who have wrecked churches because of carnality of their lives and because they use their liberty as a cloak of maliciousness malice biting one another devouring one another wanting the top job envying someone because of their position in a church or whatever it happens it goes on and we know that but what is it it's earthly sensual and devilish two questions before the last point what causes us to abuse our liberty? Carnality. We're carnal. Carnality. The second question, what can be the lasting consequences of this? Division. If we see division in church or churches, we know that it's got carnal or carnality um, mixed in there in the school. That's what we find. And being carnal is bitter, envying, strife, and they're lying against the truth. And everything that is happening to them is earthly, sensual, and devilish. This is what the Word of God says, but it brings division. So the abuse of liberty, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Watch out, and he says you will. The last point, point five, is verse 16. The power for liberty. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. See the capital W? Walk. That's emphasising. It's a capital for a reason. Walk in the Spirit. The Spirit of God, the third part of the Trinity. Because that is also a capital S. And ye shall not fulfil the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. If we're walking in the Spirit, we won't be envious of somebody else. We won't be causing division and trouble. We won't be trying to argue our point and think, well, I know more. As soon as you do that, I know you know less because you're not reading your Bibles. You're not walking in the Spirit, and neither would I be because we're just trying to... Pride's coming in, I know more. Get to the Word of God. Walk in the Spirit. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfil the lust of the flesh. Romans 8 verses 4 to 5 has these words to say about walking in the Spirit. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. We know that royal law to love one another. Who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And how do we do that? We read his words. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We don't care about the world anymore. It's like this morning's sermon. We have that coin. One side spiritual, one side physical. And that's your life. How you spend it is up to you. Do you spend it on self? The short 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years we got? Or do you give it to God to use? And 
then you find that life later. Because as we keep that for self, we will surely lose it. But if we accept Christ as our Saviour, we shall find it. Life eternal. Romans 6.12 Let not sin therefore reign. Okay? Christ is our King. Okay? And we've been taken from, and through our liberty he is our King and we're not the subjects of sin anymore. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, the flesh, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. And indeed this world is full of lusts. It's full of things that we want, things that we desire, whatever they may be, coveting, etc., etc. Or the lust of the flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Peter 2.11 has these words. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I urge you, I almost beg you in a way, but I beseech you. As strangers and pilgrims, that's what we are, abstain from fleshly lusts, which what? War against your soul. So whenever we've got these lusts, whatever they may be, it's warring against our soul. That's what it's warring against. That's what it's warring against. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from these things. Abstain from these coveting. Abstain from whatever you're putting in front of your eyes. Abstain from that. Because it's warring against your soul. Warring against your soul. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. When we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're saved, when we daily put him on in that sense, when we are walking in the Spirit, when we're reading his word, we're in our, to the best of our ability obeying his commands, we're putting on Jesus Christ. We're wearing him for the day. And if we're showing him off what sort of clothes we're wearing in that sense, then we need to be walking in the Spirit. But put thee on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You know, this, this law and liberty, so this liberty and love is very important for the fact that we have been set free from something that was our master. So let's not be entangled with it again. Otherwise, people suffer. Marriages suffer. Children suffer. Church folk suffer. All because maybe just one person, maybe one wolf that comes in is trying to make a mess and wreck the churches. Two last questions. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Continue in the word. Put on Christ. Read the Bible. Pray daily. Pray daily. Pray hourly sometimes. Just be in constant contact with your Heavenly Father. That's right. Put on the full armour. And don't just pray to Jesus the man. Pray to Jesus Christ in his divinity. Christ Jesus. Jesus Lord. Because even Jesus said when he was asked, how do we pray? Say our Father art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. We respect your name. We respect it. Hallowed. It's precious. It's holy. That's how we are to address God. The second question. What are some practical safeguards to uh, avoid fulfilling the lust of the flesh? What safeguards us from fulfilling the lust of the flesh? Read God's word regularly. Wear Jesus Christ. Obey his commands. That's what it means to wear him. Obey his commands, love your neighbour, the royal law, and keep your eyes from beholding evil, wicked practices. Now sometimes we just need to discipline ourselves. Mm -hmm. Discipline. It's not that hard to do when you are walking in the spirit, when you're reading his word. We must live disciplined lives. I'm not saying lives that are devoid of fun, and etc, etc. Of course we can. But we just keep away from the flesh. And things that can cause division. So as, you, as we just come to a close, just briefly go through liberty and love. There's the call to liberty we see in this uh, chapter. There's the use of liberty. There's the law of liberty. There's the 
abuse of liberty, then there's the power for liberty. It gives us power. And that's what we're being liberated to. The power of Jesus Christ and his authority to keep us away from sin and to be sanctified fully in his service. Because as we're living carnal lives, he can't use us. We're dragging his name through the mud. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And please, don't call me Lord unless you hear the things that I say. Hear the words of Christ and say. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your words tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this liberty where we have been called into, Father. You've drawn each and every one of us to yourself, to salvation. And Father, when we realise that we could not uh, give ourselves eternal life and that we were wretched, wretched people, Father, living in sin and that we had a sin nature and that there was no way, dear Lord, we could um, send ourselves to heaven, Father, only through the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you called us first. And we thank you, Lord, for forgiving us for our sins. That now, Lord, we can be called the children of God. Once again, Lord, we just thank you and pray that you'll take us away this week in your liberty, Father. And help us, Lord, not to use it for an occasion for the flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.